Okay, my name is John Schillingford. I am uh, I am giving you this uh, talk today on sponsor responsibility management of your vendors. I've been in the industry a long, long time, both in CROs and in other companies as well. And uh, so, what I'm going to do is give you a very short half hour, thirty five minutes uh, talk on uh, on management, your responsibility, um, and uh, indeed how to get the best briefly out of your your CRO. Let's see if we can actually change the slide. Yes, we can. Hey, I'm in business. Good stuff. Okay, just setting the scene. What I wanted to do was, um, and by the way, this little boy is not one of my children, but I do like the photograph. And um, it's uh, basically just to illustrate the fact that uh, this business, we need to be very firm and very clear on, on how we communicate, because that's the way you get the best out of things. Okay, so what are we talking about here? Key message. As always, this has really come from ICH, it comes from all of the FDA guidelines, it comes from the EMA as well, uh, MHRA, whichever authority you're under, you know, we're all focused on patient safety first and uh, in, being able to ensure and prove data integrity and that it's auditable. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first of all touch on uh, on EU and US regulatory expectations. You know all this stuff. You don't really need me to go into it. But it's just really to, I wanted to show what the development was from the original ICH guideline ECR1. And of course, we're moving on to R2, which I'm going to talk about later. Uh, regarding the responsibility of you, the sponsor, for your studies, even if it is uh, delegated out to a number of vendors or your CRO or whatever. It's all about, you know, the uh, principles of Helsinki, Declaration of Helsinki and the rights of the patient. It is worth saying at this point when in the uh, both the American and also the FDA and also the EMA situation, uh, the FDA point out here that if you are not uh, undertaking your adequate and well-controlled investigations, then of course this is going to affect greatly uh, your ability to actually get an approval from uh, the regulatory authorities. Um, ICH have really written some very, very nice guidelines on this, have been encompassed into European law, and it's all hinged towards you match those, you get your approval, you don't match those, then you do not, and as simple as that. So really talking about, you know, the development of consenting and uh, the official review of documents. I really don't want to waste uh, too much time on this. But they also recognised the regulators that they needed you know, within their own banks qualifications of their inspectors uh, to be correct. Um, so that they're up to the right uh, standard of education and training. Uh, and it is also our our... our how within the industry, the pharma industry and the medical device industry, that you have correctly trained staff at all levels that they need to do. I, I saw a medical device company recently where I was, uh, I was observing a young lady being sent out to site to monitor uh, a user evaluation of a medical device uh, and this uh, poor lass had absolutely no training in it whatsoever and was lost and uh, totally against all guidelines of GCP. Really quite terrifying. The other thing is, of course, you know, regarding the trial master file, archive, you do not need me to go into any of this. This is what we do. Bottom line is that ICH came up long ago now, as 2007, um, with a sponsor may transfer, and this is the point I'm going to talk about now, any of the uh, trial related duties. Um, but the ultimate responsibility for the quality and integrity of the trial data always resides with you, the sponsor. There is no way out of it. There's no wiggle room. I was at a conference in Boston recently where I was asked that. and People were really quite shocked when I said, no, no matter what uh, you have, you have uh, asked your, your, sponsor, your vendor to do, you are actually responsible for their quality as well. So, you know, it all comes down to the implementation of quality assurance, quality control. You need to know what they're doing and how they're doing it. Okay. It's also true of their electronic trial data systems. You need to know that if they're using an electronic trial data system, your auditors need to be pouring all over it and coming back and saying, yes, it is validated. No, it's not validated. 
If it's not validated, then you don't go there. It's as simple as that. Uh, a validated system is everything that, the, you know, it's a pain. I know that the uh, that the FDA, uh, what's it, uh, CFR 21 Part 11 um, is, is always thrown around. But the thing is, it's an exacting, uh, it's an exacting requirement requiring exacting validation. If we haven't got it, then uh, your data is really becomes questionable. So be very careful about your data management systems and your data collection systems uh, and also your data storage systems. Uh, everything is now very... So here we go. Uh, when do you allocate and contract tasks to a vendor? Ask yourself that question. How are you? Uh, where does the responsibility remain for my project? I've answered that already. I shall reinforce it now. It is with you, the sponsor, your medical device company, your uh, pharmaceutical company, your technology company, whatever it is. You have got the responsibility, so sorry about that. Keep calm and take the responsibility, and uh, that's what needs to be done. So what does this mean for you guys? Well, documentation, documentation, and documentation. You need to be able to prove that the people you've got working on the project uh, know what they're doing, are educated well enough to do it, uh, that they are being well managed, and that you have a system of oversight to actually see and observe what they're doing. So you need to be able to show the authorities that you are getting the right reports at the right time and the right communication system. And you can only do that with very close documentation. So in terms of, you know, the vendor, you know, this is, this is what you need to do. Due diligence before, during and after the studies. But don't forget that you may do your due diligence up, up front with a uh, vendor, but at the same time, over a two, three year period, they change in nature. That's what happens. And you've got to know what those changes are, and you've got to be aware of them, and you've got to know if they are affecting the quality of your study. SOPs, processes and system validation, SOPs always makes me smile. I was uh, talking to a CRO only the other day when I said to them, I'd like to see your SOPs to know what we're doing. They said, you have to travel to our offices and see it, uh, to which I question. We all have SOPs. They all are, you know, pretty much the same, yet changed very, very slightly. I can never really understand this ruling that says we can't let anybody else see them uh, because it shows our processes. Well, we all have similar processes, uh, folks. Um, so uh, really knowing what your SOPs are and that you're following them is a fundamental need in your, in your uh, oversight procedure. Training records, you know them. Okay, so really the big challenge is, you know, what is your oversight uh, and what's essential for your oversight? Okay, have we talked about, and I'll talk a little bit about oversight later on, but I want to tell you now things that can go wrong and when it goes wrong, what happens. Um, I'm particularly going to talk about the FDA. The nice thing about the states, we can say many things about the political situation at the moment, but I'm not going to go there. What I am going to say is that the Freedom of Information Act means that you can access a, a very a huge amount of information regarding where they, for instance, the FDA are sending out warning letters to uh, to uh, to companies uh, where they have, shall I say, not kept the best standards of GCP. Um, why I say that is because you know um, I, I I tend to look at the FDA. Uh, letter listing. It's all on the net. You can just look it up. Just type in FDA warning letters and up it bobs. Um, because it's interesting to keep pace with what, what they're thinking and the way that they are reviewing uh, companies. And this is extremely important for us. Okay, I, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but it gives you an idea on, on that particular slide. Uh, that uh, SAEs and drug safety has been a particular um, uh, a particular uh, factor for both EMA and FDA over the last, and the European authorities over the last uh, 10 years, certainly. And many of the um, audits that I've worked, I've sat in on uh, with, uh, with, with the regulatory authorities uh, have ended up with a focus on drug safety. And this is where uh, Pfizer didn't quite get it right. Okay. Uh, so they had a warning letters and they had other warning letters coming through. Um, and this is a case really of them having to then prove to the FDA that they'd taken cognizance of the warning letters and done something about it. The next one really is a warning letter to J&J &J and Icon. It's, I know it's old, 2009, 
But let's let's go with this for a minute, shall we? This is a warning letter informing regulatory uh, violations found very much within the ICON clinical trial uh, clinical research group. Now, don't get me wrong, this is a few years ago. I kind of recovered now, but at the time there were obviously uh, regulatory, shall I say, monitoring issues. Okay. It said our investigation found that ICON failed to properly ensure monitoring of the studies. Now, this is an interesting point, and this is something which I think is really important. There is a growing a growing uh, volume of, of, of warning letters as such, where where the authorities are coming out and saying uh, inadequate monitoring. Now, inadequate monitoring means that our, our, our vendors, our CROs, are basically sending out, um, sending out the, uh, the CRAs. And basically, they're, they're just not up to the job for whatever reason. You know, and it could be a million and one reasons. And this is a big red flag for you who are there to oversee the authority. Because don't forget, the quality is reflected then upon you, the sponsor. Okay. Um, then they, there was there was another um, another set of warning letters regarding nursing units and a phase one unit as such. I won't go into that detail, but what the important factor is at the bottom, um, Icon instituted a whole range of training and retraining and monitoring and co-monitoring that went on for a number of years, and all of that was very expensive for the company, but at the same time they realised they had to do it. But it wasn't until the 22nd of August 2014, don't forget the original letter was 2009, until 2014 uh, when, uh, when the FDA wrote and said, yes, you have now dealt with all the issues. So this is a, an expensive life. So I then went and looked at the FDA warning letters for the 2015. Okay, and here we go. Um, the, again, this is, I can talk about this because this is all open. It's on the website. It's public. Uh, so AB Science. There we are. Failure to ensure proper monitoring. Heritage Pharma safety reporting. Um, at CXL failure to ensure proper monitoring. Um, I, I won't even go to pronounce it, Army Motor Medical Group, failure to ensure proper monitoring. I think you're taking my point at this point, and that is, um, this is an issue that we have to deal with, and we must make sure that the way we observe the monitoring in particular and the drug safety systems is that we have oversight, and we can only do that with training, documentation, and methodology of, of having teams to monitor teams. I just want to take a quick five minutes of your time because ICHE 6R1 is now being updated. It's, a, it, it's out. It came out 9th of November, I do believe, 2016. So it's now coming into law across Europe. So it's all good stuff to get trained up on this now. If you haven't got the E6R2 update, then go get it. Okay. So look, the original E6 was 96. So you can imagine it's getting a bit old and rusty now. Since 96, uh, which is a good 20 years, um, there has been EDCs come in. There has been a whole whole you know IWRS, IVRS, um, a whole system uh, of more complicated studies in terms of adaptive designs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Technological electronic stuff that's come in and gcp needs to modernize with it so you know they have basically revamped the whole of the uh, uh ICH e 6 and they call it r2 it's now published and you can get it as well in actual fact um there there is a very nice yellow booklet out um which uh, it's got a nice summary also and is well indexed it's probably worth looking for that booklet as well okay so the modernizing it, the guidelines also amended to encourage implementation of improved and more. So they're recognizing, they're recognizing that the clinical trial methodology is changing, particularly adaptive design, uh, and also uh, other factors within, and also risk, was it risk approach monitoring, um, to, which, which is also developing. They've recognized that and actually leaning towards it as well as a methodology. Right, who in actual fact sat on it? Well, here we are, EMA, of course, Japan, US, but they also had the, the Swiss there, um, 
Canadians there uh, and also Brazil, uh, Chinese Taipei, Korea, uh, etc. Okay. So, um, introduction, they've added certain things in the glossary themselves. They've added, uh, well, you know, the, the wording of a certified copy. What they're saying here is that if you're making a copy of uh, for a, a TMF, uh, of documents across multiple TNFs, if, if, somebody's, if you're keeping a core TMF, paper TMF somewhere, and you need another copy somewhere else, fine, but please make sure it's certified, it's signed and dated, etc. Monitoring plan. Many of us have been doing monitoring plans for years, but ICH have just updated and recognized the fact that we should have uh, an IC, uh, a monitoring plan, which is good. And detailing more information on the monitoring report and also validation of computerized systems. So they really uh, recognize that uh, the FDA uh, approach of uh, 21, uh, CFR 21 part 11 is built in as well. Okay. Interesting enough, there's just a little point there about the investigator responsibility. They have felt that the CROs in general have been taking so much work off of the, off the investigator themselves that the investigator has not been actually taking responsibility well enough. And the reality of it is ICH is now saying, you know, you, the investigator, uh, are responsible for supervising your tasks. Uh, you're responsible for ensuring the quality and the procedures within your unit and also the source doctors and trial records for each trial subject attributable legible contemporaneous original accurate and complete they've added the word complete that wasn't in the last one but complete is a factor okay but here we go sponsor responsibility what are you down here for well you're responsible for implementing a system to manage quality there is a big section in ICRR2 regarding quality management. So get it, read it, and get your guys to train train the teams up on it, okay? They're talking about uh, detailing and risk management, uh, focusing on essential trial activities, and methodology to assure quality of trials. How are you overseeing and controlling the quality of your study? If you are contracting it out, you need to show that you have oversight, okay? Um, and also, I like the last bit, avoid unnecessary complexity procedures and data collected. We've all done studies where everybody's wanted to measure everything. Uh, we've said, oh, we better have that in as well because you never know when we're gonna need it. Um, and even the regulatory authorities are saying, what the devil are you doing that for? Okay, so just in terms of quality management, they're focused on critical processes and data identification risk identification, risk evaluation, risk control, risk communication, a risk view and risk reporting. In terms of the risk evaluation, I've got an interesting one because they're also asking us to estimate the risk of not identifying the risk or catching the risk during the study. And I find that a fascinating um, exercise and it's something that I will be spending a bit of time on trying to work out how to do well uh, over the next uh, few months. Okay, sponsor responsibilities, the emphasis, again, this is ICH 6R2, oversight, subcontracting over, you know. but interesting here, if you, your contract research organization is subcontracting i uh, say a CRA in Uzbekistan because they don't actually have a CRA there. So they actually contract a another CRA uh, who, who's not actually one of their employees. Then you should, one, should know about it. Two, should actually approve it. And three, should be absolutely convinced that whoever they've contracted uh, is correctly trained, uh, has the right CV and is acceptable. And there is a way of this person being monitored and you having the correct reports that indicate that that monitoring takes place. Okay. So here we go, monitoring. I talked about risk-based. There is a section in there about that. It's well worth reading and it's something which I'm sure, um, well, we've all, we're all doing it in certain forms or another, centralized, uh, using an EDC system with a centralized monitor, dictating, if you like, which sites need to be monitored depending upon the risk analysis and the risk-based system that you indicate you write up at the beginning of your study uh, and of course it's in the monitoring 
guidelines as to how you're going to manage that situation. Okay. Um, TMF, there is a section obviously there on, on the TMF and um, gives you the usual details. Um, still, there is near, there's no real clear guidelines for how long you keep the TMF. There's all sorts of rumours about it. We're talking about 15 years, I think, the latest, but um, I, you know, I think it's one of those things that we, the sponsor, need to archive away and keep forever. Uh, the sites are currently being told that they need to keep the um, their site files for about two years after the after the drug is marketed. Um, again, I would recommend that that's kept a lot longer. Okay, so implementation. Well, it's up and running now, guys. Um, so in actual fact, the document's available. Uh, that's the routine they've used, and it's there. So, so now we know who's responsible. And it says sometimes you just need to take a deep breath. All right. Just don't forget, in many cases, we have multiple vendors and we have to balance our way across all of them. You know, you've got your clinical data manager, maybe separate from who's running your protocol. You know, obviously, uh, a number of you will be using one vendor for all of this. But certainly for, you know, as working as I have done in biotech industry and the medical device industry, we quite often keep uh, different groups for different things. For instance, um, all safety management. Uh, throughout Europe was done with one entity um, who took safety management for all the studies, which is, of course, they, what they need to do. Equally, with data management as well, good to keep all of your uh, data management with one system because, trust me, CROs can make a lot of money about integrating databases that are delivered and shown up from different vendors, certainly in the past, my group have. Okay. So vendor management, let's just say, let's all make it clear who's doing what, uh, who are the players, um, how, how are we talking to each other, what's the technology, and again, I talk about the SOPs and processes. Okay, Documentation of roles and responsibilities, this all brings me down to what we said earlier about documentation, documentation, documentation. Critical decision points, all part of the risk analysis situation. Who is your decision maker in those key decisions? Who is actually dictating what to do uh, if things uh, do become, shall I say, uh, requiring a change in the way things are done? Uh, core deliverable metrics, my, my bid there, yes, by all means, identify your metrics that you're going to measure your CRO, but don't make it too many and do only take the relevant ones for you. Senior management love metrics and sometimes they get hung up on metrics. And the trouble with metrics sometimes is you could be chasing patient uh, accrual, for instance, uh, which you know gets behind in many studies. You can be chasing patient accrual, ignoring the data quality. And the, and the patient quality and the patient profiles that are going into those studies. And you can ignore that by starting too many different countries with too many uh, treatment protocols. Um, and what is defined as chronic heart failure in, in, in some countries and the way they're treated is different from other countries. So, you know, what I'm saying here is your metrics choose, but also uh, be very careful on the way you use your metrics because you can get easily burnt. Uh, I certainly have done, so um, I've uh, learned the hard way. What I do is, um, as a uh, in my biotech uh, pharma and um, a medical device role, you know, I will actually put a vendor a vendor management plan or project management plan, whichever you want you want to do it. It, it. Where I would summarize the project, I would summarize the strategic approach, i.e., that I've got Group A. Uh, monitoring in the Baltics. I've got Group B monitoring in somewhere else, um, and I've um, and I've got a communication plan that they all talk to each other. By the way, they're not kept isolated. The project scope: um, what is the size of it? What you know? And are we looking for it to be an adaptive design, for instance? In which case, what is the maximum project scope? Uh, and what is the minimum? And what are we going to do? How are we going to uh, how are we going to manage the bits and pieces? 
risks and contingency planning well risk analysis of course is getting better and better and i see some really good risk analysis done within the uh, medical device industry um, and that i think is, is is the development where you say this is an unacceptable risk we're not going there or this is a risk which really isn't going to happen so we can cross it off the list but it i you know would always say that your project managers must always have a contingency plan and any project manager that's worked for me over the years will know that i will always look at them over my glasses when they come in with a crisis i go okay so what's the plan and what are you going to do next it should have been written down you should have thought it through right at the very very beginning Project team plan, communication plan, subcontracting management plan. That's almost your oversight plan. And then we can go on. The only reason that I've highlighted safety management plan, because I think that's one of the most crucial, and that's the first one that, the, uh, that many of the authorities will go and look at uh, when, when, they're, uh, when they're coming to audit you. Okay. A quality management plan I've also highlighted mainly because of ICH E6 R2 and the heavy uh, the, the heavy uh, requirement that they've got now to for again convincing uh, that you are there on the quality management uh, of your developing project. Okay. So just to re-emphasize what I'm saying, sponsor responsibility, monitoring. You need, you need, you need to be absolutely sure that your monitoring is up is up to scratch and you know um, it's it's uh if your cro is running a centralized monitoring system you have access to that monitoring system and you can see on a day-by-day -day basis what is going on uh, and what is being prepared and what the reports also look like coming in um, again, I would always, and I've seen this from CROs before in the past, where they send a monthly report in and it's literally just sheets and sheets of metrics and sheets and sheets of accrual and data management in the database and all that. What it doesn't have is a what's going wrong and what's going right. Uh, and I like to see an analysis of the project manager sitting down and saying, well, this has gone wrong over the last month, but we put it right by this, or we are proposing to do A, you know, A, B, C, and D in terms of the contingency planning. Um, and that sort of written analysis really helps you get a grip on where the project is. If they're not providing you with that, that oversight, it's very difficult for you to have an oversight. You have to trust their oversight, and you trust their oversight with time. Once you've got used uh, used to the way they work and they're used to the way you work, open communication, time, building trust. Okay, these are the vital vital factors for uh, for getting a, a decent uh, relationship with your CRO. Okay, so I'll just talk a little bit about the monitoring management. I am very keen on the last bit, which says over, oversight plan, independent monitors. It is worthwhile sending out some independent monitors, either from a special group who are uh, secondary monitors for within your own company, or maybe hiring some independent monitors to actually go with the CROs from your vendor onto site uh, to ensure that they are monitoring up to scratch. Uh, sounds a bit um, big brother watching you, but you know what, given, given what's going on with the regulators, I think I would much rather do that in a very supportive way, um, rather than, than risk having an, in, a, uh, a letter coming from the regulators going inadequate monitoring. And again, document, 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 and document. If it, if it happens, document it. I was never a great fan of Donald Rumsfeld, but he said he had some wonderful sayings. Uh, as you know, you go to war with the army you have, not the army you want or wish to have at a later time. Donald Rumsfeld. Another takeaway message on management of vendors. Can you please avoid the blame game? It's uh, being yelled at. Nobody likes being yelled at. Um, I had this uh, German boss who uh, who really would always, you know, be very direct in the way he he spoke to me. Jochen a great guy, and he basically would always say, um, you know, John does his ganz falsch. Not you, you know, you might like to think of this a different way, but ganz falsch, completely wrong. 
Um, but at the same time, his next statement was always, mm, now let's see how we can how we can solve this problem. How we, I love the word we, because it meant he wasn't blaming me or my team. He was just blaming the situation and it was a we game. Yeah, and that's me in the middle being supported by my co-workers. And I've always said in moments of need, you need to support each other. And uh, certainly these guys were, were doing it for me. And my last thing, but for heaven's sake, never forget this. You know, when we're all plowing through data and we're under deadlines, we've got senior management yelling at us um, because we have not got data in or the data's not clean enough or it's not what it should have been or whatever. Well, these are the guys that we're working for. This is what it's all about. And one day we'll all be patients. And one day we'll all, if you're not taking medications already, we all will be. And um, so let's get it right, shall we? Okay. That's me. If you ever need to contact me, please do send me an email. Um, I'm very happy to, uh, to do it at any time. Um, and I will always answer. And if I cannot answer your question, uh, please, rest assured i will always know somebody who can so thanks very much and uh, take care bye